Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Brad Chamberlain. Today is July 11th, 2021, and this week we are entering into a series on the book of Ephesians. Today, we'll be looking particularly at understanding our identity as people blessed, chosen, and adopted by God, and the hope which that enables us to live within. Join me in this responsive call to worship. You read the parts that are in bold. Lift up the gates of your soul. Open the closed doors of your mind that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The God of countless hosts. This is the King of glory. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that is available throughout the whole of time and space. Today's reading is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope in Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Let's read our prayer of confession together. We read in Ephesians that we were chosen by God before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before God in love. Such a privilege, such a responsibility. God chose us to be holy and blameless. We do try, but being holy all the time is not easy. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail. We read that we are destined for adoption as God's children through Christ Jesus. Such a privilege, such a responsibility. Our identity as members of God's family should be apparent to others. That means being recognizable as Christians through our words and deeds. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail. We also read that we were marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance as God's own people. Such a privilege, such a wonderful privilege, knowing that the burden of living up to such an inheritance has been taken off our shoulders because of the grace which has been lavished upon us. For God also promised that in Jesus we have been forgiven according to the riches of his grace. May we always be aware of the tremendous privilege which has been bestowed upon us by God, and may our response to such blessings be to live as graceful and as joyful followers of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, 
who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Offerings may be given through a check sent to the address shown or by clicking on the Give link on our website at umcmagnolia.com. Let's pray. Generous and giving God, you have poured your blessings on us as the rain soaks the sun-parched gardens. You have lavished us with redemption, forgiveness, and grace. When you send the rain to water the plants, you expect growth in return. Remind us this day as we make our gifts to you that we have been blessed for a purpose, that we might be a blessing to others. May we grow in compassion, in mercy, in longing for justice and love, as Christ loved us. In that holy name we pray. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our New Testament reading this week brings us to the book of Ephesians. We'll be studying this book together in our services over the next few weeks. If you are like me, then you know that you can find Ephesians after Galatians and before Philippians and then Colossians, because, well, at some point I memorized that after the Gospels come the Acts, and then Romans, and then the two Corinthian books, and then we get to God eats potato chips. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So, we're digging into eats, Ephesians. Ephesus was the Roman capital of Asia Minor, where modern-day Turkey is, at the cultural and continental crossroads between Asia, Europe, and Africa. It was a center of commerce. Paul didn't start the church in Ephesus. We don't actually know who did. But we do know that when Paul arrived, he helped organize the local Christians and their mission efforts to the surrounding parts of Asia Minor. In some of the early manuscripts, however, the location Ephesus isn't even found in this letter, and its origins have a bit of, had a bit of debate since as early as the year 140. This letter may not have been written to Ephesus in particular, but was likely a letter written and circulated to many of the churches at the time, perhaps with a blank for the local congregation to fill in their location's name and make it personal. And to top things off, we, aren't also, we also aren't really sure that Paul wrote this letter. Consensus is actually that he did not. This is based on text and word use analysis. There's just different words and phrasing in this than in a typical Pauline letter. And there's also some theological shift by the author from where most of the Pauline letters are. For example, Paul kind of saw marriage as a concession for those who were too weak to be single. Whereas in Ephesians, there's a much higher view of marriage. It mirrors the relationship between Christ and the church. It's also different from the other Pauline letters in that there is no personal details of individuals or glimpses into Ephesian church life found in this book. But whoever wrote it, and whoever it was written for originally, the main theme expressed is God's plan to reconcile the Jews and the Gentiles, which was accomplished once and for all through the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
and the author's scope of this book. It's cosmic. God's final purpose is not only human reconciliation, but also unity and harmony in the entirety of the universe. The church, with Christ as its head, is a means to accomplishing that purpose. Ephesians starts saying, quote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So, let's start here as well. You are blessed. You are chosen. You are part of the family. What does that mean for you? Do you feel marginal or unimportant, neglected? You are chosen by God. You are blessed by God. You are an integral part of the family. You belong. You are worthwhile. Your life has meaning. You are a child of God. Some of your human relationships have failed you, because humans will always fail you. But your identity, your worth, your sense of belonging doesn't have to be ruled by the frailty of humanity. We can live lives rooted in our identity as chosen, blessed, adopted children of God. As the text unfolds, we read in verse 10 that God's plan is to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The good news is not just for us. It is not to be contained within the walls or Zoom rooms of the community of faith. It is not just for you or just for us. We are overjoyed to be chosen and blessed and adopted. But that's just the beginning of our faith. That's our foundation. The hope and the will of God is that the whole world will be gathered up into the blessing found in covenant relationship with God. That all of creation and all the people would be gathered together into God's eternal community. And our job is not to seize hold of this God-given identity and count ourselves better than others. It is not to care only for ourselves or to care only for other believers. Our job, according to these verses in Ephesians, is not to draw lines of exclusion, but to live with wide open arms of grace-filled faith. To be open arms welcoming, blessing, and adopting others, other broken people, into the family. This is, as verse 11 says, the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. We who have been blessed or are ongoingly blessed are the very ones who bless others. And in fact, we ourselves were brought this blessing from others. Think of the people who are important in, your devel in developing your faith and in understanding your identity in Christ. And we now, together, are Christ's body. We have been blessed by others in the body and adopted into the family. And now we, the blessed, are the ones who bless. We who have been included are now the includers. The circle enlarges. We aren't the end nodes. We are wires in a circuit. If it doesn't flow into and through us, then the circuit is dead. We are the ripples which bring transformation into a world which sorely needs the influence of God's kingdom. We have to start. We have to start with owning the truth of our identity. We are chosen, blessed children of God. Done. Not changeable. Not negotiable. We don't really want to own that for a few reasons. It's a lot to live up to, for one thing. I know I'm not worthy of it. I don't deserve it. I know the truth about me. These verses don't really apply to me. They might to you, but not to me. I'm too messed up. Everything I've ever experienced shows me that I am unlovable. I don't belong. I'm a burden. I'm alone. Well, that... 
is all lies, all vestiges of our earlier self. Self-preservation habits and attitudes which were necessary before we understood our identity in God. But now we do understand that identity. So these other thoughts, these old habituated senses of self-identity, they are done forever. You are blessed. You are chosen. You are a part of the family. You are important and beloved. And so, owning that, we still grow exhausted by action, by our own inaction, by the scope of the need in the world around us, by how tired we just feel every single day. We may have this identity, but we aren't strong enough to live up to it. I'm sure not. I'm constantly feeling overwhelmed and inadequate. But guess what? God knows that. The verses in Ephesians 1 go on to show that we are given the Holy Spirit as our strength. If love is the energy that flows through us, the Holy Spirit is our lithium battery pack, or maybe our solar cells, creating within us the power to carry out our calling. We are given a promise of sustenance, a reminder that we aren't on our own in all of this. We are marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, it says. This is not some future promise. Like if you live just right, God will grant you the Holy Spirit at some future point because you earned it finally. Rather, it's a promise for right now, today, sitting here in this pew or at home watching on YouTube, you have the Holy Spirit. The Divine Spirit is with you right now. You can count on it. You can lean into it. You can trust that you are not alone as you seek to live out the good news of blessing, inclusion, and adoption. And as a sign of that presence, there is a community that surrounds you, a community that is a part of you. The verse ends showing that all of this is so that we might live for the praise of his glory. The purpose of all of this blessing and inclusion is to bring unity and to praise, offer praise to God. The, identity, the idea of unity is found throughout this text in a way which disappears in the English language, at least in our dialect of it, is throughout this text, you, second person, is never written in the singular. It's in the plural. It's you all, you guys, all of y'all. You all are blessed. Y'all are adopted. You guys all give praise to God. This is not an individualistic faith. It is not about just you singular or just about me. And it's not about just us as in you and me, but it's about us as in all of us, everyone. To individualize the faith is to misuse the essence of what is offered here. It is not singular. Presence, community, relationship, these are not singular. They are not you singular. They are you all. The true impact of this faith is when we participate through the strength and love of the Holy Spirit in the life of the community, when we offer to God even our relationships as the means of witness and praise, and as we engage with a hurting world as a source of blessing, healing, wholeness, and peace. Through the Holy Spirit, we are able to be conduits of love, blessing, and inclusion into the world around us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, right? There are empty virtues all around us, which only become valuable when they are imbued with love. This idea is expressed beautifully by Richard Rohr, who wrote, Justice without love is legalism. Faith without love is ideology. Hope without love is self-centeredness. Forgiveness without love is self-abasement. Fortitude without love is recklessness. Generosity without love is just extravagance. Care without love is duty. Fidelity without love is servitude. Every virtue is an expression of love. 
No virtue is really a virtue unless it is permeated or informed by love. We people are the same. We are empty until filled with love. And as we are filled with love, we are simply conduits of that love on to others. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, strengthened through God's love, blessed, included, chosen, and a part of the family, and are serving that, all of that, all of that love on to others. The author of Ephesians, probably not Paul, but maybe Paul, says that all of this is the result of the choice we made of setting our hope in Christ. This hope is not a thin wish. It's not a starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight, or a birthday candle kind of thing. Instead, it is the very purpose behind our living. It is the driving force that moves us out of despair and into joy, out of self and into relationship, and out of the church and into the world where we may live this hope out loud, as it says in verse 12, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. Amen. Let's pray together. O oh God, our creator and comforter, we thank you that today you have called us to worship you and learn of you. You alone know our needs. Satisfy them with your unchanging love. In your presence may we find comfort in sorrow, guidance in perplexity, strength to meet temptation, grace to overcome the fascination of disobedience, and courage to face up to the hostility of this rebellious world. Above all, may we meet Jesus and go out from our worship, indwelt by his Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive today's benediction. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. All right, bye. See you next week.